Ready? Hello. Uh, welcome to the Activism on the Ground Roundtable um, at this year's UPSS Graduate Student Conference. Um, our moderator today is Diva Woodley. She is Assistant Professor of Politics here at NSSR, uh, focusing on social movements in the U.S. primarily, um, as well as politics in the lives of everyday people. Uh, she also recently gave um, a paper at the WPSA in Portland on uh, presidential rhetoric uh, to some acclaim. So please join me in welcoming Diva. <laughs> Um, hi, um, as she said, my name's Diva. I'm actually um, kind of subbing on this panel um, today, but I'm so excited to have the opportunity uh, to be at this conference. I've already, I've already enjoyed uh, the part of it that I've been able to see. Um, so today we have with us um, a, a, a large and distinguished panel um, of activists or scholars, um, or scholar activists, activist scholars, whatever you put as your primary identity. Um, uh, today, and I think the way that we'll proceed, if I understand it correctly, is um, you all will make some remarks. Um, I'll ask you some questions, which you can then respond to, and then we'll open it up to everyone um, uh, so that we can have a wider discussion uh, about um, politics on the ground, and particularly um, the question, which is our prompt today, about um, that critical movement um, or the critical. Um, change uh, in political activity when it goes from protest to movement, right? Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll hear back from you guys whether or not there's a bright line um, that, that we can identify uh, from protest to movement um, or not. Uh, and if there is no bright line, what kinds of things, right, should we be looking for to indicate um, that shift, that critical shift, or that moment when a critical shift can happen? Okay, does that make sense? Um, I don't have the materials to introduce each of the pa panelists um, individually, so if you could introduce yourselves um, and tell us a uh, little something about your work uh, before you begin your remarks. Is that okay? Okay. We'll start on uh, I'm Yotam Moron. Um, I'm, from, I'm from New Jersey. I've lived in New York. I uh, do a lot of different kinds of uh, activism and social justice work. I uh, have a background in communal living. I lived in a commune for a while, and I have a background in democratic education. We helped start an educational collective that uses democratic methods to do social justice education with youth. Um, and I've got a background in like Jewish youth movement stuff. It's very complicated. <laughs> um, and um, uh, right now, I am uh, busy doing a few different kinds of activism around New York City, mainly. In, in, with, around, whatever Occupy Wall Street is or thinks it might be, whatever that whole mess is. Uh, so I'm involved in a lot of that stuff and uh, help plan some of the uh, large actions in the fall. I'm working on a week of actions in mid-May around budget cuts. Um, and I write, and I'm part of an organization called the Organization for a Free Society. You want me to do the, my whole? No, you're right. I think we should do introductions, and then we'll start back with your, your remarks. Good morning, good afternoon, whichever it is for you. I'm not going to impose. Um, <laughs> so my name is Melissa Jira Grant, and yeah, I'm also occupying, quote unquote, a somewhat complicated position as a writer, as an activist, um, and also someone who's now writing as a journalist about social movements, um, the most often writing for Alternate, The Guardian, I've also written for Slate, um, Jezebel, and the much beloved Spread Magazine, which is a magazine run by and for sex workers. Um, the sex worker rights movement is really my home, and it's mostly what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I'm a former sex worker. I've worked in a lot of different contexts. I've organized with the Service Employees International Union to create labor contracts for a peep show in San Francisco. I've done media trainings for sex worker rights organizations, including this really rad health clinic called St. James Infirmary, which is based in San Francisco and operated by sex workers for their own community. Uh, and I've also worked in philanthropy, which was kind of, kind of a weird lark, um, at the Third Wave Foundation here in New York, helping to move money to young feminist organizing and sex workers in particular. So the politics of philanthropy are a particular interest of mine as well, and how that can shape, shift, and impede social movements. My presentation is going to be a little shorter. <laughs> uh, my name is Nicolas Grau. Uh, I am Chilean. Uh, currently, I'm studying uh, economics at UPenn. 
and uh, I'm here because I was uh, president of the um, uh, union of my university, Universidad de Chile, University of Chile in Chile, and uh, during the um, the protest protest of 2006, uh, which which was called uh, the Penguin Revolution, because it was it was commanded by the high school student. Uh, my name is Steve Lambert. I'm an artist. Uh, I also teach at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Um, I used to teach here at the New School uh, as an adjunct a few years ago, and um, I taught it. I taught judo at the Hunter College in their intermediate arts program, <coughs> um, which will make more sense maybe when I show you what I do. I have no training in martial arts, um, <laughs> and I. So I make work, I like, you know, sell work in galleries, but I also have always made stuff in the street and, um, you know, use whatever media seems best for the issue I was working on, or the idea or concept I was working on. And um, lately I've been working with Steve Duncombe, who teaches at NYU in the Gallatin School, and we started something called the Center for Artistic Activism. We do trainings with uh, activists on the ground in, like, Texas. North Carolina, uh, Maine, Boston, New York, um, on how they can be more effective with their activism and use sort of design strategy and creativity and their activism to come up with new ways of achieving their goals. Um, so that's that's a rundown of what I do. Great, thank you, Steve. Yeah. Okay, what's up? Would you start us off with your remarks and we'll just proceed in the same manner? I just want to caution you guys that you have about 10 minutes. Um, and I'll give you a little wiki or a wave um, when you're approaching time. Um, um, okay, so I'm going to break the ice. Um, so I, I'm not exactly sure what how, how to make any sort of compelling case about moving from protest to resistance. I'm going to kind of make it up as we go. I think don't, in general, if we knew the answer to that, we'd be in a, in a different place. Um, I think for, I think I'm I'm not convinced that that's the that that's what that that's the terminology from protest to resist or uh, to movement I think um, protest is part of movement and I think there are a lot of things that are not movement which is what we want to get to um, but that we need to use all of them to become a movement um, first of all I think we need to always be making a case that we need a movement so that and that's not a given actually I being here at the New School taught me that that's not a given. I was involved in the 2008 um, December occupation here at the school, and there was a really strong tendency of people who, who literally believed that you don't need a movement, that you do not should not have a movement for social change. I remember being interrupted. Actually, it was it was all fucking mess the whole thing, but it was like got interrupted by someone who, when I said something really inane about blah, 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 movement, something, and then someone interrupted me and stood on a table and said, um, movements are dead, long live the insurrection. <laughs> what? <laughs> so that's a, so in, in other words, I, I, that might sound, I, I don't know, you know, where we're all coming from in, in this room, so maybe that doesn't sound totally ridiculous. Uh, but it, to me, it's, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. It's also offensive and incredibly problematic um, for a whole lot of reasons. Um, because it rests on this idea that, that what's gonna ha what needs to happen is shit needs to get so bad and that that's what will cause people to rise up and spontaneously rising up is what's gonna, I don't know what, I mean, because the sentence never really has an ending. And, or what are we gonna have after, I'm not sure what that'll look like, but it's based on this like really awful um, idea that we ought to let things get bad, which is an old school idea too, it's not, it was reinvented by, by contemporary tendencies, but there's also roots of that in Orthodox Marxism and other tendencies and whatever, um, of uh, it's going to get really bad and then people will rise up, which on the one hand is really cruel, because it's like shitty to stand by and let that happen, and on the other hand it's empirically absolutely not true, like there are people all over the world who are starving right now and not rising up. Uh, that's just one does not lead to the other. So, in other words, uh, we need to build a. I, I'm going to just kind of throw out there that I think we need to build a movement in order to, uh, on the one hand, uh, create the institutions of a free society, the ones 
the institutions that will actually allow us to live according to the values that we want, while also being able, being strong enough to confront the institutions that dominate us now to create space for those institutions that we're building. And that that means actually uh, confronting power, because power is real, we don't get to just like, like, will like rise up and then everything just kind of like withers it's not it doesn't work like that power is real like there are real things like you get hit with like people with clubs like if you oppose but you know so that there are real implications to confronting power and that's what you need a movement for in order to confront power and take it actually take it and use it in a participatory way along the values of the world that we want and then you have to get into this whole conversation about what are the values that we want to live by and what institutions do you need to design to be able to carry out that kind of life and so what it, and then how does that inform the movement that you want to build et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. but so first of all the premise of the conversation i hope is we need a movement um, and then uh, i think protest is um, I don't think protest is another phase. So I don't think it's we're in the phase of protest moving to the phase of movement. I think protest is one of the tools that helps build a movement and one of the things that a movement does. And there are other things that movements do. Movements also, or people right now all around us do all sorts of different things. Some people protest and that is sort of like uh, coming out in order to, um, you know, oh, whatever, we, I think we get the idea of what protest is because that's kind of one of the most popular things that happen. Um, <laughs> There's organizing, which is kind of like, you know, banding together in groupings to actually uh, win things, which strikes me as pretty important. Um, and there is building. There are people all over the world who are actually building the things that they want for their lives. And some of those do groups do that narrowly, like uh, for themselves. Like I used to live in a commune and we had a shared bank account. That was really awesome for us. It didn't particularly change the rest of society. Uh, and then we built an educational collective in an attempt to leap outside a little bit, but still on a very small scale. So there are people doing all sorts of things like that, all sorts of alternative institutions that actually are the seeds of another world. And then there are people who are doing that uh, in an effort to change that other world. But so those are a lot of different components, and protest is one of them. And I think a movement is a thing that has all of those things that are actually united under something. That everybody has the sort of autonomy to carry out the things that they need to do in solidarity with one another. So there are people building those alternative institutions, the institutions that actually will help will, will, will help us embody the world that we want to live in and actually meet people's needs too. And there are people who are out in the streets confronting, building counter institutions. So those are institutions that fight and confront the power that actually is exacted on us. And that can be anything from a union to an anti-war movement to whatever. Um, and then there are people who are organizing to win things now. And I think that's something we also have to deal with. And, and I don't know that that's something we need to deal with here, but winning things now is a complicated thing. So we do want to win things because that's what helps people survive and that's what grows the movement, but we want to do that in a way that always um, has, ha you know, has in it the implication that, we're, that it's never going to be enough, that we're, actually, that we're actually trying to make a fundamental social transformation. We're winning things now because, that's, because we need to in order to survive and because we want to grow the movement in order to really win big. And so the question of how do we win things now is important to ask. Like we need to be choosing struggles that expand the movement, and we need to be fighting them in a way that expands the movement. So for example, winning a free CUNY is a really important, that's hugely important, because fighting for it is going to take being out in the streets, which teaches you how to be in, out in the streets. And it teaches you all sorts of connections, like why are the cops beating me up just because I want to go to school? All of a sudden, it connects a lot of different things. So how do you fight? And what do you fight for? A free CUNY would allow a whole lot of students to not have to have two jobs and would expand the movement. So I mean, so those are kind of internal questions to movement. So anyway, just to kind of like, I don't know what I just said. I just said. <laughs> but so ultimately, <laughs> I think the point is um, that uh, we need to be doing a lot of different things, protest being one of them. And the question of how do you turn that into a movement, that's the real question, but how do you connect it to a lot of those other things that still need to happen? And I think that right now we are in the very beginning of a potential movement. Um, I think we're on the cusp of something that might become a movement and it's going to be really hard to tell that for the next 10 years. But, uh, but there is something going on here that is, and I think, I don't know if this is 
if I'm still on top, I don't know if I was ever on topic, but in terms of <laughs> Occupy Wall Street and what's impressive to me about it is, is it, hasn't, it hasn't won things, it hasn't really built any sort of serious institutions, it hasn't done a lot of those things that I said need to be in the checklist for a movement, but it has um, like opened some possibilities. And that, I think, is what's really special about that, and that, I think, is also a precondition for a movement. So there, you, know, you need certain conditions, things have to be actually, they have to be bad, and they are, uh, and they're going to get worse. Um, and there need to be people who are organizing or building or struggling <coughs> already, and that, that, that is the case. There have been people all over the world struggling all, over, all throughout humanity. And then there needs to be some other thing, some sort of magic dust. And I think right now it's this sense of possibility, um, which who knows if it's going to last, but I think that that's... We're in, a, we're in a really special potentially movement moment. shitty conference in San Francisco called um, like Feminists Against Pornography or something, like one of these things here, where people like went out to, um, oh, I'm not going to make it all the way around the room, sorry guys. Um, <laughs> well, there you go. I don't live here, so someone else should. That doesn't <laughs> preclude the, <laughs> right, so, anyway, 1978 at a conference a lot more boring than this, um, called Pornography, Feminists Against Pornography and Prostitution or something. It was in San Francisco. And they, they did one of those like marches where they go past all like the porn stores and the strip clubs up in North Beach, which is kind of like the red light district of San Francisco, and a place that I used to work. Um, and then they like come back to the conference. Everybody's like all worked up and upset because they've seen all these things that are like really terrible, but also kind of fun and exciting as the anti-porn movement kind of works. So they're all sitting down. And they're going to have this conference um, about how horrible these things made them feel and what they're going to do next, without actually considering that maybe the people who make pornography or work in the strip clubs like might be in the room and might have feelings about what's about to happen. So the name of the session that's written up on the wall is um, "Feminism in the Sex Use Industry." And, and so this woman um, named Carol Lee, who also uh, goes by the name Scarlett Harley, raises her hand and says, you know, I feel really fucked up about this, and actually this doesn't describe me, and I'm actually a prostitute, and I actually work in a massage parlor, and the room is like, er, what? Like, we didn't actually expect the people that we you know were going on about to be here in the room with us. And so she proposes that they change the name of the session to the sex work industry. So this is the very first time that anybody proposed these two words going together, sex and work. It did not come out of the academy. It didn't come out of public health. Mm -hmm. Yet all of these institutions have now taken this term that came as a form of protest in this room and as a way of trying to make something invisible visible in the moment. And also highlighting the fact that, and this is a huge struggle for movements in and of themselves, is who is leading the conversation? Who is setting the terms? And in this room, the entire terms of what was going to be a political action were being set without the involvement of the people most impacted. So that's sort of where I'm going to center my, my remarks. Um, how do we make sure that doesn't happen? How do we make sure that our movements are actually led by the people who are directly facing the greatest amount of injustice and oppression? That's theoretically the things we're trying to undo. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about like what has to happen in order to make sure movements do that. And then what happens at the other end of the line when you start to see fucked up things like co-optation and like how to do something about it, which from my time in philanthropy was one of our biggest concerns. Like how do we, as this big external institution, support people doing all this alternative institution building without completely taking over what they're doing and turning it into all of the kinds of stuff that it was originally intended to fix. Um, so 78 is, for all intents and purposes, kind of the birth of the sex worker rights movement. The first really big international action that kind of brought the movement together and seeded it out from the United States to the UK to Italy across Europe uh, was a multiple occupations that all happened in 1985. And it started with the English collective of prostitutes uh, who were building uh, their own legal clinic to deal with the fact that the police were really targeting them. So, you know, not just targeting them for arrest for prostitution, but also after they had been arrested taking away their kids, kicking them out of public housing, going after their partners and saying that they were pimps because the way prostitution law is written in the UK and in the US and still is, if anyone is living with you and um, 
benefiting from your labor as a sex worker. Like, I could be a housewife and I could go and, you know, take my husband's money and gamble it away and that's fine and legal, but if I'm a prostitute and my husband's taking my money and buying a TV, then all of a sudden he's a pimp under the eyes of the law. So <coughs> it, was a real, it was a real need in the community to find a way to fight back. This was something that was damaging every single facet of their lives and it had a really clear target, which was the police. So they started organizing, they created this law clinic for themselves, it was open to all kinds of poor and working women in London, and it was really popular. And the police knew this because they started winning. They started actually getting prostitution cases thrown out of court. And so what did the police do? They cracked down harder on them and harder. And there was one winter where like a thousand prostitutes were arrested in London in a matter of a couple of months. So when they decided to occupy, um, it came from a place of real community need. That people were very scared. People actually needed a place to come together and share resources with each other. And so when they picked their target, they picked a church because they were looking for sanctuary. It was like a, an incredibly symbolic and an incredibly practical act of occupation. And what happened when they actually went into the church, um, because they didn't, they already anticipated being retaliated against after the occupation ended, everyone wore masks. And so there was a kind of flattening, but also a kind of solidarity. When you looked at everyone in that church, everyone's wearing a black mask. They were in there for 12 days. They had allies coming out of the woodwork who had never supported them before, lesbian organizations, peace organizations, the kind of mainstream, respectable women's rights groups came out and supported them, which was huge because that gave them a measure of protection from getting busted up by the cops. And even like vicars and priests supported them nominally, but that didn't last for the entire occupation. Um, so it was a huge success. And I think the thing to take away from that is it came from a place of actually having to meet a real practical need that there was no other way to meet this need quite on that scale, and they also had a sense that if they keep fighting one cop, one police station, one law, they were a small group. They were only a couple dozen people. They would exhaust themselves before they could actually win, and so it made sense to kind of ratchet up their game and to do something really bold like an occupation. So it was a very strategic decision, and it was one that you know had a ripple effect throughout the world and was a real moment of the sex rights movement putting itself on the map. On the map. Um, so skipping forward a little bit, that's 85. Um, that that <laughs> sense of needing to build your movement based on like the absolute most important thing that's in front of people, not some theoretical idea of like what's going to be the best future society, or you know, a lot of the things that I think come out of like academic ideas of movements. When you're centering people who are actually struggling in their day-to-day -day life, it's going to look really different. What happens? Um, and I think the best example we have of that in recent history in the states is the work of ACT UP, um, starting in New York in '87 meeting together every Monday night in what's now the LGBT Center and these like massive General Assembly like meetings of hundreds of people all bringing whatever it was was most important to them that day, whether it was their partner just got diagnosed or they got denied health care or they were just fucking pissed at Wall Street because the drug prices were so high. Like all of those needs and concerns were equal in that space. And the first action that ACT UP took, which I feel like has sort of been obscured in our very sanitized history of HIV, mm -hmm. was a demonstration on Wall Street was physically laying their bodies down on Wall Street. And their demands were not, you know, raise awareness of HIV or like better education about HIV. It was drop the drug prices, release the drugs, stop being greedy and stop playing with our lives. Their target was not the disease, it was the state and capital interests that were turning the disease into an epidemic. And that's been completely lost, I feel like. That that's something that if you step back from that and you look at ACT UP and you look at Occupy Wall Street, the targets are exactly the same. But the way that they did their organizing came out of such a deep and immediate moment where people were literally facing death that it made people take such profound risks. I think it's you know absolutely a moment to look back to as we're thinking of what Occupy is going to look like as a way to draw some lessons. Um, I don't know if I'm running out of time. I'm oh, I'm sorry, you're right, I should. Yeah, we still have about three minutes. <laughs> okay, so, so kind of wrapping those two movements together, talking about sex worker organizing and occupation, talking about um, ACT UP's literal occupation of Wall Street uh, in 1987. After that, you know, one of the things that people might look at as a success of all that organizing is kind of the mainstreaming of HIV. So now I'll take you back to the condoms that I gave all of you guys. So those are like groovy New York City public health condoms. New York is like really proud of like making condoms available everywhere and isn't that great? You know, taking care of people who are actually sick, that's kind of a primary, another concern. But making sure condoms are available is something that New York's really proud of to the extent that they've branded these condoms. Um, and all of this money goes into the Department of Public Health to make these condoms available to you. And at the same time, New York is pumping tons of money into the police department to go out and take these condoms away from people on the streets. Why is this happening? Part of it is this breakdown between 
where this struggle started, which was essentially dealing with violence, <coughs> lack of access to resources in people's immediate lives and the ways they organized around that, and the way that HIV and sex work underneath it has been professionalized into a job for people, working in a clinic a little step removed from the day-to-day -day needs of people's lives. So you can have people in the Department of Public Health who in New York right now are saying, yes, we think it's totally sensible for cops to be taking condoms away from people on the streets because that's how they fight prostitution, which is what they're doing. Why on earth is the Department of Public Health supporting this practice? How did we get to this moment where very radical people were able to go in and say, like, we need to work on HIV, we need to end this virus, we need to end this, the virus to the scale of epidemic to now saying, you know what, we think it's totally okay for cops to use the presence of these condoms as a way to say that this person might be a prostitute, which is, is what happens. So all of you that I gave condoms to, like, may or may not fit a cop profile of a prostitute, but if you do and are, you're, you're walking in a part of the city where the police believe that prostitution happens, much like stop and frisk, they can come and ask you questions, try to determine if you're loitering with the intent to commit prostitution, which is an incredibly vague crime, you're standing around with that you might do something illegal. Um, and then ask you to turn out your pockets or your purse, so thank you, you've just let me off the hook, now you have all of my condoms. Um, so this happens, and, and there is actually you know, some organizing from all of these communities to try to stop this gay men's health crisis, Housing Works, the Sex Workers Project, the Red Umbrella Project, all of these groups that come from these movements that I mentioned are now working together to try to turn this back. But they're having to do things like fight the Department of Public Health, which is crazy. Like, how do we get to this moment where these things have become so depoliticized that they're almost meaningless. Um, and so that's kind of the caution that I put up front is when do we lose sight of the struggle? When are we going for wins that are not wins? That are like these like little momentary band-aids that like will help us get a grant or get a good story written about us or like make another organization think that we're not so threatening. And then where, who do they actually fuck over at the end of the line? How do we not get to that point? I don't have an answer for that, but I'll stop talking and maybe we'll get to it. I will. Okay, so uh, thank, uh, first, thanks for inviting me to, to this, uh, this talk. Um, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Chilean experience, uh, mainly on the uh, education and social movement in, in Chile. Uh, and I think I'm going to say some stuff uh, about, uh, about how to win uh, some. some uh, some, some things and about uh, basically I'm gonna try to s to see what is my perspective about what uh, we have won in Chile and uh, what, what what we didn't basically okay okay Chile has a, a long tradition of uh, social movements um, in particular in, in, in education even for the last uh, 20 years I would say after the, the the return to the democracy in the 90s. Even though the, the political activity has been uh, quite irrelevant in Chile, I would say. Uh, even, even in that context, the <coughs> high school student and the college student have been performing a bunch of uh, protests during the years. Um, basically, each two years or even each year, uh, there, is a, there is a big movement. Uh, the intensities of this movement uh, change, but basically it's always the same. Uh, the same goals, meaning uh, a more determinant role of the government, regulation, tuition fees uh, to improve the public education, the end of the profit-oriented school, which was something new from the 80s, from the dictatorship. Uh, in some, basically, less market and more social justice. This has been the, the agenda for these uh, 20 years with different, as I should say, with different uh, uh, success in terms of uh, media, uh, media reception. Something that I, I have to say because uh, I, I am here in New School and maybe you can be interested in, 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 in studying the Chilean case, something that for me is really idiosyncratic to the Chilean case is the, is the participation of high school students, which is really strange. I mean, you can see around the world, I mean, all people in university in all the countries, they organize and they always ask the same things. But what is really strange in Chile is the power of high school students. In particular, in my year, in the 2006, I was president of the union of my university, and we basically just support the, the agenda of, of these kids. And they, I mean, I'm going to say kids, but they are not kids. And they, for example, just to give you a measure of uh, a broad, uh, uh, an idea of, of their power and their organization, they took like 
500 uh, high school for like uh, one month. Uh, they took the control, and uh, which is something really big. I mean, you you can imagine the organization, how they they have a different approach than the university. We are more vertical. We have a lot of tradition in the in the university. My my union has has been there for 100 years, and people respect in general that, that union. Uh, but it's something really to, to study. So I encourage you to study the, this, <laughs> this particular phenomenon of, of, of Chile. Okay? Um, so in this, in this context, I want to, I want to stress two, two points that I think are pretty related with the, with the question of this, of this matter. Okay? The first thing is, uh, I think both the 2006 and 2011 revolts, the, the biggest um, in the last uh, 20 years have been really successful in disputing and controlling the political agenda. Okay? In both cases, the, the public or opinion overwhelmingly endorsed the, the movement's uh, demands. And for example, in the last one, in the 2011, even though after uh, six months of uh, strikes, um, demonstration on the street, and a school, school takes over, so basically, that was really annoying for the rest of the people. Okay, even after that, the public opinion uh, support uh, in all the polls, basically. For example, to give you an idea, um, the, to this idea of uh, of uh, finishing the, the the possibility of, of having profit-oriented high school, they, the polls say that 80 percent of the people support support that. Okay? So it's really strong uh, support. Okay? So what I would say is uh, the social movement in Chile has found its space. Okay, it has shown that it can affect the scenarios in some way that the political parties cannot do it, which is something. So for me, at least, when some movement or political party, any anything, when you show that you are necessary for, for the politics, because you can do something that nobody can else do it, okay, and you are the most efficient organization in, to, to do that, I think is when you found that space, is basically you, you, you become necessary and, and you have some something to, to do in, in politics. So mm -hmm. I think this is pretty pretty clear in, in the Chilean experience. And, uh, and something that I would like to stress is that the politi the power of, uh, of, this, uh, of those uh, social movements, it's, uh, it's not just that they, they, they organize the things pretty well so they can show the same thing for many, many days. And, okay. uh, so, but but the, the real power of them is that how is, is how they convince to the majority of the population. Okay. So, for example, in general, the, the right uh, uh, media, the right wing media, they always stress that these people uh, get attention because they, are, they, they use violence or uh, because they do many demonstrations. But what is really true is that if you do all the performance that you, you can imagine, but you do, you do not get the, the support of the, of the people, okay, Chile, you're not going to have power. So at the end, it's a really democratic uh, movement because it has powers to the extent that it has support from the from from, from the people in general. So I think this is the is something important to stress because many people and these people they have a really narrow uh, conception of democracy. They always stress that the the power of those of those moments movements is uh, is uh, is com comes from the from the action that they do. But this is not true. The, the truth is they have power because they have support of the, the people. Now, to say something about the bad part of, the, of our, of our uh, experience is that the, having the, the people support is not enough. Okay? For example, as I told you, even, even last year, in the, the pool says that we have 80% of the support for changing this uh, profit-oriented uh, condition of the high school. Uh, the right wing co coalition, which is running now the the government, uh, had preferred being closer to the to the ideology than being closer to the people idea. So, which is for me understandable. If, they, <laughs> if you are in the government, you cannot you do, you do want you, you don't want to give up to your ideas just because people want to want that. Okay? So I, I I understand that. But, um, so and what is more important maybe and this is related with the with the question of uh, how to win basically. Uh, what things we can win? Uh, the problem is that the strike, the strike and, the, and taking the school cannot last for the time that we need to undertake the change that we need. Basically, what people is, is asking in Chile is is changing the structure of our school system. So this is going to take I don't know one year, five years, ten years, and basically in the in this movement there is a lot of rotation. So people is changing. 
you cannot you cannot took your your high school or your university for I mean, the last year for was six months, but this is still not enough to to do the change. So basically, the question in Chile is uh, we need some political organization taking advantage from these scenarios created by by the by the movements to push for for the change for the changes. Uh, we need some political institutions who are able to sustain a long run debate about the, about this, those issues and being able to rationalize the effort in order to have uh, those, those changes. And for me, this is what some political parties should do. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is the role of the political parties. Okay? And this is what we lack in Chile, basically. We don't have some political parties that are taking this opportunity that the movement is creating so efficiently. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I mean, the situation that we have is that the center left that has uh, that run the, the, the last 20, 20 years uh, has shown that they put uh, more weights on stability than on change. Uh, for example, in the 2006, when they have a really good chance to, to have a big change of, uh, of uh, in the education system, because uh, it was not that easy to get the change. At the end, they prefer to sign a, an agreement with the with the with the right people. And uh, there is a famous picture of uh, Bachelet with, uh, uh, taking the, the hand with the other people, with the right people celebrating this agreement was was really, I mean, really below our expectations about about um, the movement. So, and, and on, for, on the other hand, the, the left is not well organized. The only thing that exists is the Communist Party. The Communist Party is not doing well. So, in sum, to to finish in my presentation, I would say that. In Chile, the social movement is so efficient in changing the scenarios, but it's not that efficient in taking advantage from these new scenarios to concrete the, the change. Basically, I think this is something important to recognize. It's because it's, it's because the, the the agenda that we have. If, if you have, for example, something that is really, if you don't have a big change and you just you just you're just asking for something small, I don't know. Maybe the social movement can do anything, but they don't need parties. But if you need something like that, changing the meaning, changing the structure of uh, of education in Chile, I would say that we lack of this uh, 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 political institution. Unless you believe in that that the social movement can create some revolution, revolution scenario where where basically is the crisis the crisis is so big, so everybody is uh, is uh, I mean is going to accept to. To, to change everything. So you're going to be able to give up give up to your ideological point of view because otherwise the, the country is going to explode. Okay. The, if you don't have that, you need, uh, you need this uh, connection between uh, social movements and uh, political parties. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, I don't know how to do this without pictures. I don't know how you guys do this. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, so, this is uh, just to give you some examples of stuff I've done in the past, a sort of a place that I'm coming from. Uh, there we go. So, um, this is a uh, giant nine foot by nine foot sign that flashes in mesmerizing patterns, insisting that you not look at it. Um, so like the piece is sort of metaphorically about power and systems of control and like you know how we're always sort of subjected to these things. Um, this is another one that um, you know where it's like dealing in humor and like taking on a voice what that I don't necessarily agree with, but like people can usually understand that it's a persona. Um, and then this is a piece that I this, my button isn't working. There we go. Um, this is a piece that I worked on with the Yes Men and like a ton of other groups. Here in New York, where we made a 14-page newspaper that announced the end of the world wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, a lot of you might be familiar with this. Um, but we distribute thousands of these in various cities around uh, the U.S. And you know, there's a lot of my work too that's about utopia and like kind of creating a, a vision of what's possible in the world that is very legible, that's in a language that people understand, that um, that they're familiar with. That's you know, like this was basically like 14 pages of policy, but in this way that like people can totally get and and um, that's like that's to me is like how you move people through that um, or from protest to uh, to action and so I'm always thinking about like different audiences and what I can do for different audiences so this is a, a sign that I made uh, last summer in Cleveland Ohio and again flashes in these kind of mesmerizing patterns and uh, you can vote there's um, 
there is a podium. So it says, in my life, this is true or false, right? And the, and the point of this is really to get people to probably, for the first time, evaluate whether capitalism was actually working in their lives. And whether they voted yes or not, uh, or true or false, like, it didn't actually matter that much because there was like a thought process where they had to evaluate it. I would get, you know, like a kind of good number of white, uh, white guys, older white guys with white hair that would just hit true and walk away. Um, and, uh, but they also had to see that there were like more than half or around half people that said false, you know. And then there would be people that said, yeah, it works for me more or less. You know, I don't really know what that means, I guess, you know. Um, but I know it doesn't work for everyone, right? So, that, so this conversation was started, and this is like before Occupy, right? So it was kind of nice when that kicked in and, and that there was, there was an extended conversation. And then, like I said before, like Steve Duncombe and I work on these uh, projects where we do trainings with um, people in uh, various cities around the country about how to be most effective in the context that they are and the location that they are, not going in and saying, like, this is the recipe for a revolution, you know, but, um, like, what are you guys trying to do and how can you do it better? So, for me, what that means is, like, being very pragmatic uh, about how I approach this stuff, otherwise I think I would have gone crazy a long time ago. Um, and, and think about very, you know, narrow intended audiences that I want to reach with a really particular message and then what the unintended audience might think of it and how I can play with that and balance a sort of like expressive action of, you know, like a feeling but also have it be instrumental and fit into a movement. Um, and so the, the, the way I got to think about this is like that I wanted to move people along a series of steps and, and a lot of this stuff I borrowed from um, this social marketing research. I'm going to come back to this uh, in a minute. But the idea that, that I had worked with before um, that didn't work, that was really depressing, was that I would tell, that I just needed to um, uh, get people to like wake up. You know, like they just needed this information. If they learned what I learned, you know, I'm like 20 at this point, right? And like reading people's history. And I'm like, oh my God, if everyone just knew this, then bam, you know, like everything would change. And, um, and so I just needed to help get this information out there. And that like propaganda like injection model of like okay you don't know this and as soon as you know the facts like that's what needs to be done um, that doesn't really work right like there's a lot of really complex reasons why people um, don't don't react to this information right like my favorite example is, does anybody in here smoke just hold your hand up and do do you know that it's going to kill you eventually if you keep doing it and you're still smoking so like knowing that doesn't change that. There's a lot of complex reasons why you continue to smoke, you know, like it's, you find it relaxing, you know, like it gives you something to do at a party. I don't know. There, there's lots of, lots of different reasons people do this. So, um, so you know, the, the, I used to think, you know, okay, I just need to raise awareness, get people to understand this, and then this is like a sociological term for, for um, like, you take it on, you, it becomes who you are. And that this, like I could do that in one shot and get people to jump. Uh, it, rather, there are like a lot of steps that go in between, um, and this is actually like a kind of very simplified version of this. There's like seven other ones that aren't there, but um, you know, you get people to sort of see your message, and then you have to get them to consider it. If you get them to see it and they never think about it, you know, like they don't understand, it's not written in a way or presented in a way that really resonates with them, that this all just is for nothing. Like it stops right there. Um, then later on, like whatever you're asking them to do, they have to remember to do it. So like I could understand that like I need to eat less ice cream um, and really think about that and realize that this is an important thing in my life, but every time I go to the store, I just like forget about it and I'm like, whoops, I bought ice cream again. <laughs> um, it doesn't work. Um, later on, you know, like I gotta actually, you know, I might remember like I'm really not supposed to eat as much ice cream. The doctor told me it's becoming a problem, but fuck it, I'm gonna eat some ice cream. Like, you know, if you don't get the person to take the action, it doesn't do anything. And then eventually, eventually, you know, it takes a lot of time that, that then I just don't even really think about eating ice cream. Um, and you can do this for all, I mean, I'm using a silly example just so you can kind of fill it in with whatever you're trying to get people to do. But this was very helpful. And, and when I realized that I couldn't really, it was nearly impossible to make one thing that would shoot people all the way along this path from like seeing something I made or worked on with a lot of people and, and automatically just becoming an anarchist, you know, like, that, 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 that's not really how it worked. Um, it was a whole lot less depressing. 
um, to do this work. Um, so an another great thing that uh, about using art is that like this is like a really old sort of communications model. Is like this person has an idea in their head, they articulate it into the form of a message spoken or whatever that goes into this person's ear, and then they have that idea. And um, with this model, like there's problems with communication if that, that idea doesn't match this exactly, right? There's something wrong with the message, or something wrong with the way it's been articulated, or the way that it was interpreted, and, and it has to go through perfectly. Um, but what's, you know, this sort of falls back to this model. Um, what's great about, like, re relationship between an artist and an audience is that it gets put into this form of this artwork, and that it actually becomes sort of like a prism, where, like, you can have multiple messages that come out the other side. One that's like very little, literal, one that might be ironic or funny, one you know, that, that can reach multiple audiences that are on different stages of those steps and can move them along further. So I forget what my next slide is. So, okay, so going back to the sign, um, you know, for some people the, the idea of considering whether or not capitalism works for them, that, that thought has never entered their mind. Like, I've talked to people who are like, well, you know, it's, it's in the Constitution, you know? Or like, <laughs> well, how would you change that? Or, or um, uh, I love America, right? So it's not, they read it as America works for me, you know? And, and then I have to explain to them, or, you know, it's actually, and it, but what's nice is that talking to them about why they're voting the way they're voting, um, I don't have to, like, win the debate, right? Like, I, I'm not in this position. I can just kind of, all I'm trying to do is slow them down and get them thinking. So, like, I was talking to a high school kid. I think I have some pictures of this. Yeah, this was in a um, public high school. And this kid was like, well, capitalism is how we determine the value of everything. Like, how do we know what things are worth if we don't have, if we can't put a dollar amount to them? And I was like, I know, because when I, I, I don't know either, because when I go home, I tell my girlfriend, I love you, $50,000. <laughs> and he was just like, what? You know? And, and I was like, sometimes when I really, you know, feel really strongly, I'll tell her I love you $60,000. And, and then he was just like, no, no, you don't understand. Like, I mean, like, you know, how do we determine the value? I was like, well, how much is your hand? And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I want to buy your hand. How much is your hand worth? You know? And so, like, for him, I can, like, play around, be sort of a clown. And, um, and like, I don't have to argue and win and give him all these points, but, like, you know, for him, that's going to move him along those steps. And someone else, hopefully, will move him further, but I don't have to do it in one piece, you know. Um, this sign also, too, um, you know, going around to, this was at a college, right? So, and there's a ton of false votes. I don't know if you can see that. But, yeah, great. Wait, no, okay. So, um, so going back to those steps, you know, like, uh, You'll hear a lot about like preaching to the converted and how bad it is. There's like value in preaching to the converted, and that's what happens in church every Sunday, you know. Like, and it works. Um, it needs to be done. You need to, you know, maintain that culture, right? So there, that that set that consolidation end after the person has done the action of like it becoming part of who they are. So so this kind of like I said, it works on that spectrum. It works on multiple levels for different kinds of audiences, and this is just one example of a work, but you know, like, that's what I think is uh, valuable about using art and activism, is that um, when it's used strategically, is that it can be, it can move people further along from that idea of like, protest to movement, you know, like, that, that, that actually is a, a thing that happens in stages and we can help that. Um, so I have, this is like, you know, more information if you want it, and that's all I have. Thank you. Well, this is the most stimulating panel I've been on in a very long time. So thank you for, um, for organizing this. Um, fantastic. So um, I guess what I want to do is just to, um, for each one of you, each one of you made a point that I really want to highlight, right? That I really want to highlight as something that's really crucial to this question of um, uh, movement or not, or how to build movement, for instance. Um, uh, and I think that what sort of came out of um, each one of your talks is that there there isn't right this bright line um, uh, or this very um, hard separation between protest and movement in a sort of um, uh, uh, you know hierarchical or ascending sort of steps in the sort of movement queue. Um, but um, so so that said, I want to highlight something that each one of you said, um, and then I think I'll ask um, some questions, not particularly directed at um, 
you all individually, right? Um, but for us to discuss, or you all to discuss, right, as a panel, um, I felt that your presentations were so rich that I'm not sure that I have particular questions for each one of you. I just want to ask you about movement. Um, so, you know, sort of as a, as a panel. <laughs> um, um, okay, so for Yotam, I think that um, one of the things that you said that I think is really crucial, um, and it's not um, highlighted enough among certainly scholars, but even practitioners, um, is this um, idea that when you're building a movement, it's not necessarily a linear hierarchical thing, right? That movement building is about using tools to the end of making something, right? Very much like the kind of metaphor of movement building, right? It's building something. It takes a variety of different tools and skill sets um, and, and contextual uh, conditions in order to come to fruition, right? Um, and activity and labor and agency and vision um, by the folks who are involved and are going to be doing that building. Um, but I think that um, there's a little bit of a tension between um, sort of your assertion that um, what we need to figure out is how to win, right? Um, what we need to figure out and how to win, and whether we need to win things now, um, and um, how, do we dis how, do we, how do we decide whether we're going to try to win things now or um, build the utopian movement that will sort of just, uh, maybe not settle everything in the future, uh, but will make our lives so much better. Um, how do you coordinate those things so that they're not working at cross purposes? I think that that's a, a dynamic tension that all movements, right, protests, moments of action or insurrection face, right? I mean, you really highlighted that moment of tension. But I want to push you all as a panel to really think about how that gets done, right? Because that is a, a moment of breakdown um, for many, many, many movements, um, for many protest actions, moment of insurrection, whatever, um, is that tension, right, of how to make that balance happen so that the people who are involved using the different tools and using their labor and agency and vision to different practical ends in a moment can be coordinated and can think of themselves as in solidarity, right, um, doing some kind of collective project. So I just want the whole panel to think about that dynamic tension because it is always present. And I think we don't think enough about um, ways to deal with it um, in a kind of almost a methodological sense. Um, you know, I have never been in an action where we sort of revert back to a methodology about, oh, here's this tension again. This is what we do in order to work this tension out. In fact, the exact opposite happens. Um, so I want this panel, this very brilliant panel and very experienced panel to um, begin to think about that, right? It always comes up. Why do, why, why would, why do we not have better answers, right, um, for how to work through that question, okay? Um, and then Melissa, um, I, um, I so enjoy. Um, <laughs> that's okay. Um, perhaps I'll go to the Department of Public Health. Um, but uh, no, no, no. I, I, one of the things that you highlighted in your talk that I think is so, so important, um, particularly in this context um, at a university, at an academic conference, is that movement cannot be based, right? It cannot be wholly based on abstractions. Right? It cannot be based on principles or modes of thought um, uh, alone. It has to arise out of, right? arise out of real human needs. Right? And not real human needs in the sort of abstract categorical sense either. Right? Meaning, next, tomorrow when I'm living my life, I'm going to be confronting this question again. And the next day, I'm going to confront this again. Right? Um, I think that we forget um, often in the academy um, and sometimes, you know, in actions themselves, right? The demographic of, of actors, right? Um, this was certainly brought up about Occupy, but we can think about that always, right? The demographic of people who are doing the actions is often not the same as the demographic that's the most affected um, by the thing that is uh, aimed at, right? The, the, the distribution of power that's aimed at. So um, it's easy to get into a problem of abstractions um, and forget about the confrontation that the most affected people are going to have to make again tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Um, so I guess I, you know, and, and that's an artifact of a movement from, from way back. Um, and, you know, I, I think that there have been a number of thinkers who have 
talked about this, right, particularly in the Marxian tradition. Um, but it still moves from the center of our thought very, very often. So I want this panel to ruminate on um, how to sort of manage, manage that tendency. Right? Since we know that there is, and for good, right, um, good practical or logistical or positional reasons, that there is a split in terms of the demographic of activists, right, and the demographic of folks who are most affected by the thing, uh, often there's a split, right, uh, the thing that's being protested against. Um, how do you do the thing that you m remonstrate us to do, right, which is to say, keep the most affected in the lead and at the center of the activity um, and to keep asking, which is the way you put it at the end, um, which I think you know, is an amazing watchword, is to keep asking who's getting fucked over. Right? Um, you know, again, I'm thinking about how to create, a, you can, this is going to be the strength of the whole thing, a methodology about how we do that. Right? That's an, that is a principle that I think we could think of as a best practice for movements. Right? Um, um, and yet, I don't think that we have very good uh, mechanisms for ensuring that that happens, right? Uh, for ensuring that that happens. So that's what came out of, of, of your piece for me very clearly. And then, Nicholas, I think that your presentation um, really drove home um, something that can be very, very contentious within movements, right? Particularly at protests particularly by those folks who would be most likely to yell, um, as uh, Yochan, you reported, got yelled in 2008, uh, forget about movement, long live the insurrection, right? Um, it can be very easy to forget, or to not acknowledge, or to, right, it's, it's a contestable claim. But your assertion, right, as someone who's worked in movement, that um, the moment of movement, the moment of protest, Right, is potentially, right, is often empirically not enough to change the structural um, uh, distribution of power and privilege, right, um, in the way that the folks who are involved in the action might like, right, and that you might actually need, right, this is something that's asserted in social movement scholarship, right, um, again and again, but is um, very difficult sometimes to articulate or persuade on the ground, is that. You sometimes need elite allies in order to make the change that you want to see, because the change that you want to see is societal, structural change. And unless movement actors are also decision makers, right, people who have decision making powers for the entire society, not only themselves, and what segment of it they're able to hold down through their activity uh, for a limited amount of time, then they need allies. Um, so I want us to think about. I want us to think less about the reasons why it's difficult to make that argument on the ground, although that's worth considering. I do think that that gets considered a lot in certainly social movements literature, um, and perhaps as we talk about our talk among ourselves um, as folks in movement. But uh, I want to think more about making it along the lines of, of the other two questions that I asked, which is that our, our, is that how do you go about, right, as a movement, right, as actors, um, as people who are willing to um, and are able to risk, um, go about making elite allies in such a way that you're not working at cross purposes uh, against yourselves and your ultimate goals, right? So it's a little bit of an extension of the question that I asked Yotam, but, um, but in your experience, right, in your case, right, you're saying, like, look, in order for long-term structural change, we need allies, right, or we needed allies in the mainstream political parties, but the nature, right, of elites who already have power is that they prefer stability to change, right? So how do you make those alliances, right, that movement needs, right, when you have um, interests, right, that are structurally different from those who are already in bureaucratic and official positions? How do you make those alliances without kind of shooting yourself in the foot, without working at cross purposes? Um, yeah. Um, and then, Steve, um, I, I love, first of all, I love your work. Um, <coughs> and the second thing um, is that I wanted to sort of, um, I wanted to sort of, the thing that came out of your talk for me was the brain, the propaganda injection picture. Mm -hmm. um, it really, really resonates with me because I feel like 
every single, <laughs> every class that I teach um, about movement or protest or anything like that, I'm for, I want to steal your graphic um, uh, because I feel like I'm always, always saying this and my students are always looking at me like, you've been co-opted. Um, uh, so, um, but, uh, you know, I just think like, I think that that sort of um, notion that movement is a process, right, and perhaps not, right, um, something that you win, right, in a moment, right? It's not a part of a game. It's not you, magical. It's not, ma it's not magical, right? Um, it's not like transformative in an instant, right? It is not, um, um, you know, uh, transmogrification or anything like that. Um, and that instead it's a, a social process that has steps. Um, how we sort of, uh, as actors, right, um, and how we even think about it, conceptualize it, like how do we make movement, how do we allow people to, as you do in the sort of um, Iraq war, uh, Iraq war ends um, utopian newspaper piece, right, imagine that future, right, really imagine it in concrete terms, which I think is so fantastic about what, what you did and what that was, to imagine that future with the awareness that, right, movement is a process, right, not a moment of blinding white light, right, mm -hmm. that will then change everything forever, right, um, is that, um, that yes, everything may in fact get changed forever, but things happen in incremental steps, right, so I wonder how you could kind of convey that to, um, you know, your work is very sort of focused outward, um, which is, you know, very much needed, right, focused outward to the general um, sort of population that may or may not be movement actors, right, or mm -hmm. protest actors or whatever. But this is sort of an inside baseball question, right, is that, you know, how do we have both the sort of concrete utopian vision and thought, right, um, with the awareness that we are in process, mm -hmm. right, um, that we are not learning the power word, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, yeah. So those are my questions for the panel. And thank you, thank you, thank you uh, to both the organizers um, and on this, and especially the panelists. You guys are <laughs> way at the top of the list. So, um, well, let's see what time it is. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, I would like for you guys to dig in um, for about, I would say, 10 minutes. Um, uh, or let's say eight minutes, um, and then I, I want to enjoy, you know, with the audience joy. Does that sound good to everybody in the audience? Okay. So take it ha take it however you want to take it. I have something really quick to kind of also link it back to Steve's work, which I love, and I, I can't remember if I backed your project on Kickstarter now. I feel bad. I should like remember that. But, it's, but it's so cool to actually like see it <laughs> out in the world. Um, yeah, and for me, what came up in, in your kind of sum up was like this idea of. Um, where the front lines even are in movement. Like with the work that you're doing, like you're moving the, the kind of battleground, which is another kind of fucked up militaristic way of putting it, but like to a gallery, to a school, to people's day to day lives. Yeah. And that's very much where I feel like when I think of like where my front lines are, are those spaces. Um, the way I think to get around this split between the activists and the people who are most effective is redefining where the front lines are. They're not necessarily going to be on the streets. We saw an Occupy. It's not very safe for many people in these most affected communities, people of color, queer people, trans people, undocumented people, to be in the streets mm -hmm. and to be risking themselves for arrest. So if we're constantly like elevating the streets and police confrontation as the front lines is the real shit, and I saw this as a journalist too, like, oh, you're so All brave for being on the front lines. It's like, that's not where my front lines always are. Like, they're in my house, they're in the clinic, they're in the courtroom, and they're on the street. And so like, if we open up where we think we're doing the quote unquote fighting and winning, and think of less gendered and militaristic ways of putting it, mm -hmm. um, then I think that's, that's kind of step one, to break that down. I could go off of that. Um, just going back to the newspaper and that, the, 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 that comes in stages, like all of that is stolen from communications theory. You know, which is really about, which is what we're trying to do, you know, is like get an idea across, but, but, uh, but also that that results in action so that you're not just talking to people, but, but there, that there is a, a, a goal in mind. Um, with the newspaper, the way that we communicated that, that it was a process is that it was dated nine months into the future. So it came out on November 9th, the week after the election. Part of the idea was, um, that okay, we won the election now. Like, let's not forget right. that there's more to do here. 
Um, and that, so that was an implied part of that, that it was part of the process. It was dated in the future, and all the stories told like things sort of like, this is how this happened. So the maximum wage law, you know, this is how the maximum wage law was passed. This is how Guantanamo was closed. And every story was about movements pressuring politicians who said, you know, yes, we thought this was right, we didn't really want to do it on this timeline, but now we're doing it, you know. And um, I mean, in a, in a way, it was sort of fantastical that all these things would happen in nine months, but, but you know, there was, there was that part of it. Um, as far as the front lines thing, um, originally that was going to be a huge street action. It's the, the idea started as a parade to celebrate the end of the war that would just be so big that, you know, there would be like, why are they celebrating the end of the war when it's still happening? Why is the war still happening? Um, and we realized that that wasn't going to be safe, especially after the RNC, where like, you know, prior to the, the actions, people were being arrested. You know, they hadn't even left their houses yet and they were being arrested. So, um, so the newspaper became very safe because it was small groups of people, even like, you know, literally old ladies handing out papers on the street alone. Um, because you can still pretty much do that in this country. You know, like you can hand out a newspaper on the street, that's completely okay. Um, and so we had no police trouble at all with that. You know. Yeah. Uh, well, first I want to, when, when you were presenting, I remember many stuff that people did uh, mainly in the last uh, protest in Chile in 2011, which you can see that they are not that related with the with the goals of the movement, but they, they really help. I mean, just let me give you one, one example. Uh, one day, for example, the student prepared some performance of uh, the thriller, the Michael Jackson uh, song, yeah, in front of the house of the government. Yeah, and like, I would say, 500 people, something like that, uh, dance okay, with a with a girl, a boy, I don't remember dancing as a Michael Jackson in the front of them. And they performed really, really well. And that was a demonstration. It was in front of the government. They couldn't do anything because, uh, why were you going to do I mean, uh, and, uh, and this uh, YouTube video, it was really uh, watched for, watch for many, many, many people. And uh, I don't remember whether there was a link. I mean, everybody knows there was a link because uh, it was, it was uh, organized by the, by the people in the movement. Or for example, Another another protest was another demonstration was to uh, I don't know how to say that in English but it's uh, a situation where everybody kiss each other pesaton uh, in kissing. Spanish okay and kissing a kissing, kissing, kissing protest in uh, in the most important uh, part of, uh, of of Chile for like thirty minutes for example okay? and again I mean and and the, the, and the interesting thing that was in was in this case that those uh, uh, demonstration were organized by people, by regular people, not for the not not the unions. I mean, obviously the unions support that, and uh, but, which is also good because uh, when you are in leading leading some uh, movement, you are really tired. You yeah, have to decide yeah. everything, and when when <laughs> when the power is really spread, and everybody is thinking how to protest, it's really helpful. So and and, and it's more creative also. Mm. So I totally agree with you, and I'm pretty sure that this video of thriller was uh, as important or maybe more important than the big uh, the, the, the speech and, uh, and this, this. Uh, another two things that I want to say um, first uh, which is also related with your your, your position is that maybe this is polemical but I, I'm, I'm, I have been here in US for almost three years and I'm really pessimistic about the, the possibility of uh, winning the common sense. I said that this is <laughs> and, but the kind of the kind of thing that you are doing makes me feel that there is some hope because this is the way to proceed. I mean, in, uh, my my one of the idea of my presentation was to sh was to show that in some way in Chile we have some hope in winning the common sense. I mean, in the last twenty years, I would say that we have won the common sense. I don't know three or four times. Okay, for like six months, four months. Okay, so though you control the media, you control everything. Even though the media in Chile is worse than here in the US, it's, it's controlled by the, by the right-wing coalition at all. I mean, we don't have any, any newspaper controlled by the, by the center left or the left. Okay? So, but even in that environment, uh, 
sometimes we are able to, to get, because basically the, the common sense of the children is more uh, communitarian, I would say. They, they do not believe in the, in the dream of America. Uh, so I think they, they, it, you have a really long run uh, fight here in changing the common sense doing those kind of stuff. So I think uh, it's something that, because you have to remember that, as I, as I, as I tried to point out, that the, the power of the movement is in how you can uh, convince to the people. And if you're not convincing to the people, you cannot do anything. And the, the last thing uh, about, the, about your, your, your question, I think that for me it's not like how we're gonna, how we're gonna make some alliance with the, with the people that now are running the government. Or the, the, but the point is, if you're a movement, mm. you have to think what you're gonna do about that. Maybe creating new political parties, uh, because the, the ex, I mean, a movement can say anything. At the end, you can you can have many needs. You can say many, but but in, in politics, you need to define some priorities. You need to do some rational exercise, which is saying, okay, we want to change everything, okay, but we're gonna define which are the most important things that we want to change. And this political exercise is so difficult, so difficult, so important. Mm -hmm. And in general, when you just have movement, different movement, for example, the ecological movement, the Mapuches, uh, which is the native people in Chile movement, <coughs> the, the education movement, maybe all of them have uh, different priorities. And sometimes they do not do the exercise of, of uh, talking together and deciding, OK, what we're going to do first? And it's something so difficult to, to decide. Mm -hmm. And this is what the exercise of creating a new political party or whatever is, is it forces you to, to do the, that, uh, that exercise. So uh, I think this is this is maybe ideology is what uh, what allows that. I have no idea, but uh, you need something, some some core or, or some structure to decide uh, democratically how to how to define those uh, priorities. Would you like to kind of dubs back to the question yeah. that I asked you? So. Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, the question you asked me, I think it. I think it. Um, it gets expressed a lot in the movement now, or in this, whatever this is, if it's the beginning of the movement or something like that, um, in, as the sort of uh, reform versus revolution, and this is kind of this debate that we hear all the time, and whatever, it's, it's got a lot of history too, and so this is not a new conversation to have, but it has a new kind of like silly looking head in this movement. Um, and uh, I think that, uh, I think there are two things to do about that. So I think your, your question was like, what do you actually do about that, or what are the, what's the methodology for dealing with that debate? Um, I think one thing you do is is put out again theory that already exists that that makes it really that makes that um, divide unnecessary, um, and I think that that's you know I, I said it earlier also, and I think everybody here has said it in one way or another is that we actually need to win things because people need things in order to survive, but also because what do you do if not win things, because there is no mythical insurrection. You win things now, and the only question is what are you going to fight for, and how are you going to fight for it, and how do you frame that win as something that's part of something much broader, un underlying it, fun something fundamental. Um, and so the Chilean student movement fighting for free education is a really wonderful mm. example of a radical demand that has its roots in something that is liberatory in the long term, but is really concrete and meets people's needs right now, fought for in a way that grows the movement. So that, you know, so I think one way is to, one way to confront that sort of the unnecessary divide is to respond to it. And the other way is to actually just totally ignore it and create frameworks for struggle that ignore it and make and smash that um, disconnect. I helped organize the um, demonstrations on October 15th here in the city. Uh, and our goal was to just like smash that that disconnect entirely. And that, so there was a day a day of action. There were five points. There were five locations. The students met here, and they went and did an action at Citibank, where which holds them in debt. Labor met here and went to and moved their money from Bank of America. The housing groups were in there, and the five different groups all on different issues using different tactics, some of them civil disobedience, and some of them marching, and some of them flash mobs, and some of them et cetera, et cetera, to attack the different targets that actually affect their lives, and then everyone converged in Times Square in this like really mythical, epic, simple, issueless, like positive uh, demonstration that had 
there's a vast disagreement on it, somewhere between 40 and 80,000 people. Reuters said 5,000, sorry. And, um, and, and that is an example of, without saying anything about anything, five different issues were expressed that day that clearly have demands attached to them that were all part of something much broader and no one got in anybody else's way and there was even an online component so you could be my grandma at home participating in this action and then everybody goes to one place and stands together and that's an example of creating frame and we're also going to have a week of actions in May that's built along that line, those lines of that day but flipped for a week so this day is housing this day is education and not on the on the day of education the teachers union will do what they do and the CUNY students will do what they do and the high school students will do what they do and everybody does what it, what they're capable of doing and they ask for what they want to ask for or don't ask for anything and then on one day they all meet together and it's part of something much bigger so the idea is to create frameworks that allow people to do what they're good at doing instead of making everybody do one thing to allow people to do what they're good at doing and demand what they need to demand but just make them do it in one place or in one in one context that then reinforces everybody else um, and, and then the only other real quick thing is that I, I think the, the question that you asked Nicholas and, and, and the response I think makes me confident that um, the question is not about political allies or how do you win political allies, although that is a relevant question for a movement. The question is, and I think you, you started to answer this, is how do you, uh, how do you approach power? And, and that's, the, that's the fundamental question because it exists. And so, uh, the, you know, what, what was, what the limit, like the limitations of a six month occupation of a high school, that's like an incredible thing to do. And it has its limitations because ultimately, the, you, you can only win so much by threatening power or by interrupting power. And ultimately, you need to actually use power. And so the question is, in different stages of a, of a social movement, what are the ways to do that? In some ways, sometimes it's right to influence people who have power. Other times, it's right to create a system to actually compete for power. Other times, it's right to take power. But the point is to, to, to directly confront that to actually build the things that we need to build. Um, I hear you. Um, and now it's time for the audience. Unfortunately, you have less time than I, well, if I were you, than I would want. But, um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I just want to say really quickly that I do think e even there's a t little bit of a tension between the two things that you all sort of offered. Um, I really am interested in this, uh, the building frameworks that um, kind of ignore or eschew the kind of reform or revolution question, if you want to put it in that way. Um, um, my main question about that tactic, um, um, because I think it's very, very productive, is go, how do you communicate that right to a wider public? Right? So it kind of gets to your area of expertise, actually, Steve. Um, um, uh, yeah, but I'll just leave it at that. OK, so folks, um, who is first? Nobody? Nobody wants to jump in? Really? <laughs> um, yes, um, yes, okay. please. Yeah. Well, first, thank you all for coming and accepting this invitation. We know you're all busy, and some of you had a little sort of last minute invitation, especially. Thanks to Nicholas and Steve who traveled to be here today. And my question is maybe more directed to Melissa and to Tom. For Melissa, I have a curiosity actually. If after stopping Chris, when you're stopped by a police officer in New York City, what follows from that? Can you actually be locked up for being, you know, caught in a subway station with lots of condoms? Are is are these actually charges that are prosecuted? How it's just a curiosity. And for both of you in your interaction confronting the establishment and here in New York, I would say, in your interaction with the NYPD, how has been your experience? I have in mind this uh, article that was in the cover of New York Magazine maybe last week about the, the title is Has Kelly Lost His Cops? And it's about the NYPD morale and how they feel mm -hmm. really, you know, <laughs> oppressed and unhappy and they feel like it's not a democratic institution, surprise, surprise, the NYPD, and they're given orders and they don't really necessarily agree with these orders and these are people, you know, who put their lives in danger and they start making $35,000 a year, it's not much to put your life in danger and be a police officer in New York City and so on and so forth. So I'm sure you've, you've confronted sympathizers and there's a lot that comes in the interaction that comes in the end, it's the discretion of the officer that you're confronting, or do you feel like just, 
I just want to hear what do you what do you think about this and how has your experience been uh, protesting and being activists in New York City? I think there's a real connection between the two too because there's you know what's on the books is the law around you know what's a violation of the anti-prostitution law, which you know you're not actually getting arrested for being in the act of having sex. You're more often than not being arrested for being in a public space where they believe that your purpose for being there is to solicit someone to be paid to have sex with them. And what that ends up, the reason I draw the parallel with Stop and Frisk is because just in the way that Stop and Frisk is targeting communities of color, young men in particular, and low income communities, and particularly uh, undocumented people, the parallel is the same when it comes to prostitution. So in the way that they are stopping, searching young men, particularly young men of color, looking for marijuana as an excuse to book them, get them into the system, and possibly detain them and arrest them, um, and to um, actually like keep them in jail for longer, maybe even it becomes a deportation offense if they're undocumented. It's a very parallel thing that's happening with women of color and transgender women in particular. Um, the Sex Workers Project and the Pros Network, who are two organizations that work with sex workers in New York, just released a study last week, which you can find online at nocondomsasevidence.org, and they actually have the police write-up sheets from these interactions with people who've been targeted. Um, and they also have documentation of them holding, you know, writing up condoms as the reason. This woman, one woman was picked up in 2011 in front of the Waldorf Hotel, and they described the reason they picked her up is she was wearing a low-cut skirt and long, had a long black wig and um, like, oh, look up less in a short skirt. And, um, and then when they searched her and found the condom with $300 on her, then that was proof that she was a prostitute. Mm -hmm. So again, it's very much a crime of racial and gender profiling. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also you know, targeting people for survival crime. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that gets sometimes lost in the conversations about it. It's not that the cops are gonna say, hey, you, you have four condoms, I'm taking you to jail. It is their excuse to keep the courts and prisons full of low income people. That's it. And you would think that that would be a much broader fight. People would be jumping on for that. But in terms of building movement, because of the prostitution issue, the connections have yet to be made, I think, in the general population in New York. It's a waste of time. Um, you had a comment? Yes. Um, oh, wait. Oh, I'm sorry. He has a comment first, and then I just want to look at it. This is both first for Melissa and Steve. Um, just sure, you know, coincidentally, I happened to give a lecture a couple weeks ago on kind of the visual politics of HIV and AIDS and how they've changed since the 80s. Queer Nation, Grand Fury, ACT UP, and sort of the creation of the silence equals death and the triangle versus today with sort of the one campaign and by clicking submit, your congressman will support antiviral drugs for AIDS in Africa. And I'm wondering if part of the depoliticization of these movements from, you know, protests at uh, either Wall Street or in um, Bloomberg, well, it wasn't Bloomberg at that time, it was Koch, but has um, sort of been normalized in a sense where we don't need to disrupt live TV broadcasts or lay down in the streets now, we can just kind of uh, you know, participate in a more sort of safe way and seeing how that's changed visually in terms of the movement's creation of politics, um, from you know, massive wheat paste campaigns and street front art to today where you, know, you can just read kind of a spoof New York Times and that somehow makes you feel like you're part of a power movement. Do you think there's been both a kind of taming of the kind of art activism and the more kind of confrontational street politics, whether it's in sort of queer activism, HIV, AIDS, sex workers, or kind of leftist politics generally um, for both? Sure. Um, I don't know if it's taming, but you know, like you're always sort of, at least the way I think about it is like you're reacting to there might be a general sense of urgency and you know your point earlier about there were actually people dying um, and that um, you know conditions have improved the, the civil rights movement isn't the same as it was before because conditions have improved um, and you know that I think it's important to remember that we do make progress you know like some we we have utopian goals and that's really good but to remember that you know that that the the path to utopia is like never ending. Um, so, so um, as far as like, I don't, I, I don't know, I don't know about that. I mean, people talk about this sort of passive, like I clicked on here and now I feel good about myself, and I, I just think that's another way. I don't think that that replaces um, anything. You know, you get one or the other. It's, it's. Although it might, that might happen, but it's more in addition to something else, and that's often more an entry point for people. Um, the newspaper didn't, you know, like we were. We, our hope was like to change laws, 
and and um, that didn't. I, there is no. I can't find a direct connection, unfortunately. I mean, there's some sort of weird tangential like stories heard. I know that it was hand delivered to Obama, which is kind of awesome. <laughs> um, but uh, and I wrote a note, which is also really scary to have to do to like write a note on a card that you know the president is going to see and be like, hi, you know. Um, <laughs> But anyway, um, you know, like, I don't know what that does. And, and th that part of, like, evaluating these kinds of works can be really harsh if you, if you want to, like, what is the direct connection, you know? Um, and, and as an artist, you know, I've, like, learned to evaluate things in other ways. Um, but I think that ultimately a lot of this comes back to agency. Like, the reason people do things is, like, you know, comprehension. Do they understand why it's important? And then do they understand what the next step is? So... The, the sense of agency that what I do will actually make a difference and if I get out there on the streets today, like something's gonna happen. Um, I think that worked for Occupy Wall Street because the, the <coughs> what what needed to be done and, the, and what you could do to have an impact was basically just go down there. Um, and so like a lot of people went down there and then like to talk to people, like that's pretty easy. When, when it's much more muddy, like how do we stop AIDS in Africa? Um, you know, like then it's like the engage, or how do we, you know, I, I don't know, pick any sort of complex issue where there's not a really clear action. It's not that people don't care, it's that they, they, um, they have a life, you know? And like, what, what are you asking people to do when, um, when they have, without, without any agency? Like, you're asking them to like, waste their time and like, become discouraged, you know? Like, to do something that is, is not gonna be enjoyable, that's not gonna have a result. Whereas if you can say like, we need you for this, and we need you, right? Like, not anybody. We don't need bodies at this protest. We need people like you, and we need you because you have this certain skill, and like, you know, like, that's what, that's what I've always tried to do, like, in, in asking for people's support. It's like, this is why I need this from you, and this is what I need you to, to bring, which sort of goes back to one of your other questions, like, how do you involve people instead of, I, I think, really, not treating not treating people like bodies and increasing number counts and marches and stuff and like how much what is what does a march provide in, in terms of agency like you go and you yell like that's kind of good but you know and, and that that like expressive thing needs to happen but I think we really need to think through like what goals are and why we're asking for people what we're asking from them that kind of thing and, and, and that that really is like the reason for burnout more than more than just people not caring or being insensitive or being that, that, that that's what you're saying but you know I think sometimes as activists we can fall into that where it's like you know people are just terrible and you know or like they're dumb you know yeah. and like they're not dumb, they're dumb. And, and they're not and they have values it's just like they don't know what to do so that's what I think I think that the quickest thing I could say is the targets have really shifted away from us so the you know the national at least in the states the conversation around AIDS coming out of ACT UP was really how to keep from getting at you individual right mm -hmm. and we really lost the sense that this isn't just about avoiding the virus this is about a massive corporate state complex of interest in keeping people sick and just not frankly giving a shit and then we wind up in this position where you find people on the left congratulating you know George W. Bush for his amazing PEPFAR package in Africa and oh isn't he doing all this great work to prevent HIV and you I find myself in the position as an AIDS activist saying like now I'm having to hold the left accountable for something that is completely crazy like why are you saying this was at all um, you know, everything else he did was horrible, but gold star for AIDS in Africa, it's like, come on, like, this isn't about money, this is, we still have the same power structure that's keeping people sick. And so the, the, the fight has been redefined away from that to, like, me, my body, what's going on with my life, to the extent that now, you know, I have really complicated feelings about getting on the train in Chelsea and seeing those ads for, like, how to take drugs. Now that your, you know, antiretrovirals are working, here, please give this chemical company this money so you can get a weight loss drug so that you're not carrying all this bloat from your ARVs. And it's like, part of it is like, thank God we're in this moment, because the other reason the fight has changed is people died. We lost people. We have a lost generation. And on the other hand, it's like, now it's become again about power and privilege and money, and who has the money to take care of themselves and who's dying. And we still haven't talked about that in any meaningful way since the game. Mm -hmm. I know that there are other comments, but we are currently at time. Um, I don't know how the organizers feel about it or you guys feel about it. I feel like... Okay, well then, um, we've got two in the queue. I know you've been waiting, and then Sophie, um, at least, um, and then perhaps after that we'll wrap it up. Okay. Okay, um, I love these comments. I would actually make you really excited. So I have um, some comments and some questions. Um, I work in a movement um, similar to the sex worker. I work with um, the and we were having major problems with police arresting people who legally had 
stringent because they were part of a, a state-funded program. Um, despite that, to a large extent, they feel like they won because this used to be the epicenter of AIDS, and it's not because they help form um, drug user unions. They also work with sex worker unions, and it was drug users that actually distributed syringes and did all of it, and he's had a really dramatic job in AIDS on that way. And we used to be, you know, kind of furious when they would talk about um, AIDS vaccines when we had this terrific preventive measure, but they did also manage to get rid of the paraphernalia laws, so that was another victory which really helped. So there are those victories, and I agree those victories um, are what the movement going. They're still going because now it's still the stops and searches, it's the mass, in, mass incarceration. There's all of these other elements that still have to be fought. Um, and I think that um, police do it because it, it's all of the rewards and incentives are that. Well, politicians want to look tough on crime and then they get elected and they tell the police you have to show massive amounts of arrests. So in terms of an, something that brings I, the success of Occupy, really, is that it brings together activists that have been active in other arenas. And a lot of those folks, I know certainly in DC, um, were fragmented. And Occupy was a, was a frame to pull them together. Um, and I think in Chile, the old frame was, you know, peaceful road to socialism and popular power. Um, and I think that, is what kept, you know, kept, well, it was also kept movements and parties were so tight. It really wasn't elites. It was communists and socialists and other left and parties and movements. And they, you know, they had amazing success and, and, and it's tragic and, but I must say that Chile, Chile breaks my heart. Because it breaks my heart. Because during the entire dictatorship, that chili survived, and it survived underground, and it disappeared after '89. And I agree. I think I don't know what the hell happened to those. The, I have an idea. I think it's the 1980 Constitution, the binomial system, and the Constitución. Um, but I think that there's been a real um, loss to movements not having part of that. Oh, and I did have a question. Yes. <laughs> the specific question for you is, is where did the, the high school student movement come out of? Because one of the things during the dictatorship was that most of that movement came out of left-wing neighborhoods, left-wing centers. Who, who are these kids? I know Camilla was daughter of um, communist activists, but the thing we know is all of them. Did any, did most of the leadership come out of the left? <coughs> okay. Uh, I mean, it's a big mystery for me. <laughs> Where <are> they? <laughs> what thing I can? Some I can say some 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 things. Um, first, uh, it is pretty clear that these people, as a as a cohort, okay, these people uh, was born after the dictatorship. So this is a big explanation I would say because people these people is not fear about just let me tell you something I was I was born in uh, 83 so I was a child in the, in the dictatorship but uh, I remember I have been in many many uh, demonstration and protests and I remember in, I was in one demonstration and I was close to some uh, army or military not not just the cops right. is what I'm saying I was really afraid about, about that I'm pretty sure that there is something inside my, my brain that is uh, I'm not that free like this uh, like this uh, kids or boys or girls. Okay. so uh, there is I think this is the most important thing is the is the cohort uh, uh, the, the second thing there is a between I, I, I know I, I know I knew pretty well the people in the 2006 so I would say that these people is uh, they are too Two places where they come from. One, one is uh, the traditional high school, which is uh, again a long, long tradition in Chile. There is uh, there are some high school, public high school that are really selective, and they have a long tradition of uh, political activity. Okay, this is one source. 
And the other source is like more uh, the people that is really exclude from the, from the opportunities in Chile. The the vast majority of the of the public system, which in which uh, school you have no opportunities, and those people were more uh, were less organized, but they were they they were really important important in the in the, in the protest. So in, even in that movement, you can see a tension between. The, the kind of people that have some opportunities in the, in the high school, uh, where they were selected in a really selective uh, high school, and the people that is really on the margin, and these people that is not, is going to, not going to anywhere, basically. Uh, but I, I mean, I don't know. I think the most important thing is this, this they were born uh, after the, the, the dictatorship. And then the second thing that I want to say is about what you, you talk about what, what happened after the, the, the 80s, I mean, for me there, there are two important things. One thing is uh, there is a big, a big frustration in, in, in the left activity, activity. because they basically they fought really, really strong during the 80s, and, and what, they, what they got uh, uh, after the, the democracy was really, really less than what, uh, what they were expecting. Okay? So, um, yeah, there was a big. I, I can say that in the all the in all the first election, for example, the in, even inside the parties there were there were coalitions okay, that were the left coalition of those parties, for example, inside of the Socialist Party, and they lost against the 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 other the other coalitions. So something happened. I don't know. Maybe they the other guys have more talent. In, in maybe I have no idea. But uh, and the second thing is that. The central left coalition has had a explicit decision about uh, destroying the movements. I mean, they they decided because uh, they were they, they this the central left people they also participated in the 80s. They were also important, and they decided uh, just I mean eliminating or not, not saying that they put in jail, but I'm um, saying that they they decided that I mean eliminate all the Political relevance of those uh, of those sectors, and uh, uh, but but I think that this is uh, this is uh, this, this is changing changing <coughs> because now there is uh, now the problem that we have as as I said is we have a big gap between what people want, what the social movement is uh, is doing, and uh, what uh, what is the offer of uh, political parties. We have a, a big gap, and I don't know what is going to happen. Uh, how, uh, but, uh, but for example, with, with this, I'm going to finish with this, but for example, now after the, the protests of 2011, even a right-wing coalition is, is discussing about uh, change the tax system. There is a debate about change the, the electoral system. So many things they are discussing. I mean, these people is the people that defend those structures that come from, uh, come from the dictatorship, the constitution. And now they are forced to discuss that issue. They, are, they don't. They don't want to do it. So they are going to do anything to 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 avoid the, those changes. But the, the thing is, given the scenario that the, the social movement created, they are forced to discuss that issues. Okay. So now the question is, what what is what is going to happen? But uh, but I mean, I, I'm more optimistic about what is the the situation now in Chile. Sophie, that actually answers. Oh, that's your question. Okay, great. Um, well, I think that we'll go ahead and wrap up now. Um, uh, I just want to thank the panel one more time for your fantastic uh, contributions um, and to say that um, what I'm taking away from this, um, as a person who thinks about social movements a lot, is uh, a sense of real optimism and hope um, for, uh, for the people who are, are doing the work on the ground and are, um, um, and, uh, you know, um, think it, leading this fight um, or creating the space where um, the folks who are most affected can lead this fight um, are these multiple uh, these multiple points of contestation um, and uh, protest and insurrection uh, uh, and movement. I do want to say that I think that you guys kind of skirted my methodological question. <laughs> um, it was a tall, it was a tall order. Um, uh, and perhaps that <laughs> I know exactly. But I, I do really want to put. I, I feel like you guys were um, 
all raise questions in that direction, and, and uh, I think it's probably my personal bureaucratic project to um, um, to make sure that movement actors, right, people who feel that they have agency in, think conceptually about and also work in these movements, um, begin to think about movement best practices in that kind of way. Um, because it's so frustrating, as you all may feel, right, um, when you're involved in different moments uh, of protests within what you think of as a larger movement, um, when these kinds of very tough um, very sort of dynamic questions, uh, but the same ones nevertheless arise again and again. Uh, and we confront them in a way um, that seems to uh, that seems to have learned no lessons. Um, you know, so um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to try to codify um, um, uh, lessons learned on the left um, when the left seems to resist. Um, codification for very good reasons. So, uh, you know, that's that's our our little paradox. But thank you guys so much. So stimulating. Um.